Hello and welcome to Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir. And I'm Alex Burkill. Today we'll be discussing yet another swathe of heat that's coming our way. But first to the northeast of India, which has hit headline news yet again this week with some deadly flash floods, which has pretty much ricocheted across this region right the way through the monsoonal season. And these heavy rains triggered a glacial lake outburst, leading to severe flooding across the Sakim state. Now, it's pretty much something which is almost unpredictable in terms of the scale, the intensity. They're calling it a cloudburst. It was also incredibly localised and mm. just produced such a sudden rise in water levels on the, I think it was the River Tista, and that triggered this overwhelming surge of water. Yeah, it's just unbelievable, really, and just incredible bad luck for locals who live there. There's thousands of tourists there. I mean, let's just describe this area. It's utterly beautiful. It's in the northeastern corner of India, and it borders Nepal. It borders Bhutan and it's part of the Himalayan mountain range. And hence the reason why they have this most incredible source of clean water in terms of glacial lakes. But sometimes these glacial lakes, which almost act as natural dams, can get overwhelmed if a storm happens. And and we do hear about this, particularly during the monsoon season. This situation continues and it has left 3,000 tourists stranded as the main highways have just been washed away and at least 11 bridges. Yeah, even once the heavy rain clears away, and the worst of the rain is now clearing away, fortunately, but there could still be some heavy bursts to come. The monsoon rain isn't clearing up entirely, but you're right, the recovery is going to be slow because of the the damage to the infrastructure. So we go from there, Alex, to the Pacific, and we're talking South Pacific this time. Yes, let's head to the Pacific. And this is where we've been tracking Typhoon Koinu. This is a storm and it actually began its life as a depression just west of Micronesia. And when it began its life, you wouldn't have looked at it and imagined that, well, the forecast models didn't imagine it would be quite as strong as it has been. It really has been record-breakingly strong in some extent. Interestingly, the word koinu means puppy in Japanese, but That's it really has That's just so bad, been... isn't it? I mean, it just doesn't describe really how this storm developed. It's definitely not been in any way puppy-like. It's no. such a powerful storm. It's brought some incredibly strong winds as it's tracked across and then made its way towards Taiwan. It arrived on Wednesday night. It brought the strongest wind Taiwan has ever recorded. Uh, And it really has been just such a damaging feature. If we look at just how windy it's been in Orchid Island, it's an area only 13 kilometers long, just southeast of Taiwan. And it measured a gust of 212.9 miles per hour. That was on Wednesday night at around 9.50 p.m. And to put that into some context, that's the third highest wind gust recorded in history anywhere in the world using an anemometer. We point that out because you can record or measure wind speeds using different equipment, but uh, using an anemometer, which is a physical piece of equipment on the ground to measure it, this is the third strongest gust ever recorded anywhere in the world using that piece of equipment. It's worth noting that there's a reason why we can't always record the strongest winds using an anemometer because tornadoes and more vigorous storms tend to damage them and break them. Hence why there will have been stronger winds than this. But it just goes to show just how strong a system it has been. Even the sustained winds, they were reaching in excess of 120 miles per hour. I think 123.5 miles per hour was recorded at its strongest. So it really was a really damaging storm. Yeah, I mean, um, our very own Julian Hemming gave us a a list of the highest anemometer measured wind gusts globally. And interestingly, this is the top 10. Number one, Barrow Island, Australia, Typhoon Olivia, April the 10th, 1996. So this one here, uh, Typhoon Queen U comes in at third, Second was Mount Washington, New Hampshire, my goodness, with a wind speed of 231 miles an hour, April again, 1934. If you look down the list at number nine, Orchid Island is there again. And this is Super Typhoon Ryan during 1995. What are the chances of that, of actually getting hit twice 
by an incredibly almost spurious outlier uh, wind strength. And that one was 191 miles an hour in terms of gas. I mean, we've never had anything like that here in the UK. I can't imagine what the damage and also how deafening that would be. The other thing when you look at the list, although 230 miles per hour is, is really very, very strong. It's remarkable, the big jump up to the second and then the first, uh, the top wind speeds of 253 miles per hour at Barrow Island. That's some extreme wind. And it's surprising, to be honest, that the anemometer survived. Absolutely. Yeah. And that could have been associated maybe with some sort of secondary vortex, maybe, a, a you know, it could be a, a, a tornado mixed in with the with the sort of thundery outbreaks associated with a storm like that. You don't know. Um, and tornadoes, they tend to be it's almost estimated wind speeds, although they obviously use other equipment as well, and also associated damage. So that gives you the uh, enhanced Fujita scale, the EF scale, which marks the tornado on how strong it actually is. Talking about record breaking weather, we need to really nod towards the latest report, which has been issued and published by the Copernicus Climate Change Service. So this is separate to the Met Office, but they work, again, like us, recording and analysing a huge amount of data. So September, so this is September 2023, their top headline, it was the world's warmest September on record. So not just Europe, not just the US, we're talking the world's warmest September on record. In terms of Europe, we're talking countries such as Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Poland, Switzerland. Uh, they saw record highs, which were above 3.6 degrees above the actual seasonal norm. So that's a huge jump from where we should be at this time of year. It's no surprise that when you look at the whole globe as well, September was so warm. So looking at September, the average temperature was 16.38 Celsius. That's 0.93 degrees above the 1991 to 2020 average. This anomaly makes September 2023 the month with the highest difference to average of any month in any year, dating back to 1940. So more information, check out our website. There's a really interesting blog about it, including um, a bar chart which just speaks volumes for where we're at in the world right now. This is an absolute sort of departure from what we've seen before. So take a look at that. It's uh, it is interesting. Um, Alex, a question for you. How many calls do you think the emergency services receive every week here in the UK? Oh, um, wow. OK, uh, lots. Uh, my guess, a couple of hundred thousand, maybe 200,000. The answer is actually between 800,000 to 850,000 calls every week coming into the emergency services on the phone lines um, in the UK. Now, obviously, all of those incidents aren't weather related, but weather can certainly be the cause of many accidents and can adversely affect the work of the emergency services as well. So that's emergency services getting to an incident. One of our partners here at the Met Office is actually BT, um, who manage the UK's emergency call centres. And as 909 manager Gav Burang explains, Met Office data, together with AI, is a vital part of that emergency response. BT operates a number of contact centres across the UK. Every single call to 999 or 112, which is the European emergency number equivalent, irrespective of your service provider, or for example, if say you make a call from a landline or a mobile, every call comes to us. Hello, police. Where are you now? We have over 1,200 people across our contact centres with numerous people in the support functions. The scale of the operation is huge. We handle around 800,000 to 850,000 calls a week. So you're talking over 40 million calls to the service every single year. We help people who may be deaf, hard of hearing or speech impaired contact the emergency services. And that will be via relay assistant type services that we provide. It also extends to things like, for example, e-call, and that could be the SOS functionality, typically that you find in a lot of modern cars nowadays. 
weather impacts the 909 service, I mean, heat and heat waves are a prominent driver. You could have anything from the public going to large scale events, a lot of footfall. Equally, there's nice hot weather, more leisure and socializing. And equally, we can extend into sporting events, for example. Football is a classic example as well. So the weather is a prominent driver, in particular temperature. I'm Kelter Jensen. I work in the research department in BT, specializing in data science, analytics. There's the opportunity to use a lot of the data that's available from the Met Office. So we got brought in from the research team to help do the data science, the machine learning, to understand those relationships better and turn those relationships into forecasts. So we use statistical techniques, we use forecasting techniques, and it's a combination of large historical data sets that we are getting from the Met Office for all your normal weather variables like temperatures and precipitation and so on, but also more specialized things like fire severity index and air quality. Our colleagues in the 999 teams could then use that in their planning for their call centers so they know how many agents they're going to need. The forecasts we produce for the 999 teams land in their inboxes every morning and basically a table of this is how many calls we think are going to be coming in, going to police, to fire, to ambulance and other categories of calls. And they can then use in their planning models along with other insights that they may have, special events and so on to then produce the resource plans looking out to a couple of weeks ahead. Yeah. Is there anyone else with you? If we add in scientific expertise, use of the machine learning techniques, it's all around discovering the insights, finding those patterns in data. It's helping our 909 teams get better at understanding how weather drives demand for the emergency services, but also using this data in a more powerful way. We've been working with the Met Office now for well over a year and continuously improving our models and getting additional data from the Met Office to improve our models. It's happening now because we got the expertise to do the weather modeling and also the availability of the data and the toolkits to analyze that data, to manipulate that data and to turn it into the forecast, really only over the last few years. Kelt Jensen of BT. Well, to prepare you and hopefully avoid any mishaps this weekend, and I know there's some rain warnings being issued across Scotland. Alex, how's the weather looking for the next few days? Let's first of all talk about the heat and where it's coming from. So we have some warm air that's unsurprisingly coming up from the south. High pressure's been dominating the picture across Europe recently, uh, leading to a lot of rise in temperatures there. And that high pressure has now settled the weather down across southern UK. And temperatures are going to climb as well as this warm air comes up from the south. And I'm expecting temperatures to start to rise through Saturday, probably peaking on Sunday. And I probably could see 26, maybe 27 Celsius. So that's the southeast because we always talk about the highest temperature across the UK. It will be the south. It may not just be confined to the southeast. I think the southwest. And it's worth noting the warmth will be spreading further northwards. Mm. You know, many places getting into the low 20s, high teens, even across some parts of southern Scotland by Sunday. Let's just backtrack a little bit about these temperatures. A heat wave has a specific definition in the UK. And it doesn't change from month to month or season to season. No, that's an interesting one. So, yeah, at the Met Office, we have our definition where we need to have three consecutive days where the threshold for a heat wave is reached. And that threshold varies depending on where you are in the country. In London, it's 28 all the way up to 25 around Scotland and down in the southwest. And there are different places have different thresholds. But no matter the time of year, that is always the threshold. When we were coming up with the definition for a heat wave, we were looking at the possibility of saying it has to be five degrees above average or something along those lines. But then that would cause issues. We could have in December, we could have a heat wave when it's about mm. you know, 17, yeah. 18 degrees, which you know, whilst it's exceptionally hot for the time of year, that that's not going to cause any major issues and 
it would be misleading to refer to that as a heat wave. So yes, we've kept with the definition uh, where it's the threshold temperatures are the same no matter of the year, which then does cause a slight issue in October when we're seeing temperatures likely to reach highs of 26, 27, mm -hmm. which is unusually high, but not quite heat wave level. And so possibly some counties along the south coast, maybe Dorset into Devon, we could be looking at some places getting close to their heat wave threshold. But I'd be very surprised if we saw those same places exceeding their heat wave threshold three days in a row. It's not out of the question, but it's quite unlikely. And it will be quite isolated, those areas. So it would be wrong to describe this as a, a real heat wave, but it is an unusual warm spell for the time of year. It is an unusual warm spell, but probably the good news is at this time of year, it's more dark than light, which means the nights aren't going to be those tropical nights, which really can be so oppressive in the summer where your body can't just cool down when it's sleeping. It's usually during the nights when the warmth becomes more of an issue for people, people who are susceptible to the heat, who really struggle in it. It's the nights when they they struggle most because you just can't sleep and you just can't get a break from it. Absolutely. So pretty much, yes, it's not unusual, but one in five or six years thereabouts, we do see a bit of a spike in heat just before we go. We sort of descend into into our winter months. How long is this going to last for? That's a good question. Uh, there is some uncertainty, as you would expect. I think the warmth is going to linger at least until the first few days of next week as we go through uh, in southern areas at least. But the system that we'll talk about in a second, bringing some heavy rain across Scotland through the weekend, that lingers and the remnants of it end up pushing their way southwards as we go through next week. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that heavy and persistent rain, which will impact much of Scotland on Saturday, currently a yellow rain warning. And within that yellow warning, there's an amber warning embedded, issued again by the Met Office, a smaller area of greater concern. And the risk really is for flooding, maybe some deep flood water, possible surface spray, all the things that you see and associated with uh, the heavy rain. For all the warnings, which are updated on our Met Office website and our social media channels, just stay up to date. See where you are. If you're making any plans for travel on Saturday, make sure you're up to date with the latest forecasts and also the latest warnings. That's all from us for this week on Weather Snap. Great to have Alex Burkhill. Alex, you've been thrown in at the deep end, haven't you? You're now one of the presenter core for the Met Office and you've been doing deep dive, 10 day trends. What's your greatest challenge through the week, would you say? I really enjoy the deep dives. I absolutely love spending some time looking at the touch screen and being able to really delve into the parts of the meteorology, the weather that uh, I'm interested in most. The 10 day trends are a little bit trickier because I don't have the luxury of the touch screen and I can't be as fluid as I'm used to. So I need to be a bit more prepared. I'm used to uh, not preparing as much as I have to for the 10 day trends, but I'm really enjoying this new role. As you say, I've just joined the presenter team full time. I've been presenting for many yeah. years uh, with the Met Office and I've been a meteorologist for over a decade, but it's great to now be in this presenter team. And so I look forward to doing more podcasts and more content with you all. That's fantastic. It's great to have you on board and to see Alex um, presenting the 10 day trend, the deep dive. Just check out our YouTube channel and also our social media channels. And he pops up all the time, along with Aidan, Alex and myself. And thank you for listening to this podcast. I hope you've enjoyed the show. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. Another great weather snap, Claire. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to hit subscribe. Then you catch all of our daily weathers on YouTube as well. And if podcasts are your thing, check out our Met Office podcast channel. Lots of information, lots of stories there. And we'll see you again next week.